Welcome back to Carnades.org. Today we're going to be continuing with our series, St. Thomas Aquinas' Five Ways for Proving the Existence of God. In this video, we're going to be starting off with St. Thomas Aquinas' first way, the unmoved mover. Now, St. Thomas Aquinas was a scholastic philosopher, and his work, Summa Theologica, which contains the five ways, was considered by some to be the paragon of scholastic thought. Now, what were, who were the scholastics, and what does that term kind of denote? They were a group of Christian philosophers during the Middle Ages whose purpose or goal was to make the Bible and the works of the ancient Greeks, particularly Aristotle, make sense together. So, based on this, it makes sense that Aquinas would equate Aristotle's unmoved mover, something outside of physics, which is the reason for all motion, with a Christian god. I mean, if you are a Christian and you read Aristotle, and Aristotle's talking about this thing that underpins all motion, that's outside of physics and reality, and is itself pure actuality, you would say, wow, that sounds a lot like God. How can I make these two things align? Remembering that Aquinas isn't necessarily trying to prove that God, the God that he proves with these arguments is the Christian God here. He's just trying to prove that there is a God out there. So let's take a look. Since his arguments is in many ways a restatement of Aristotle's argument for an unmoved mover, it's important to understand the Aristotelian concepts that Aquinas is working with here. The three concepts that we need to look into to understand this argument are movement, actuality, and potentiality. So first, let's take a look at potentiality and actuality. Now, this is somewhat confusing because it's not really how we talk about these things anymore, and these concepts really aren't how we explain the world. But that doesn't mean that they couldn't categorize things that still exist in the world. It's just no longer how we talk about things. So Aristotle uses two concepts to explain genuine change, potentiality and actuality. To put it very simply, actuality is the fact of the matter, what something actually is right now. Potentiality is what something could be. Or in other words, the actuality of something can enact change in other things. It can move something. While the potentiality of something is its own ability to change or be changed. So your potential, your potentiality is your ability to be changed in one way or another, to be made hotter or colder, angrier, sadder, all of those things. Whereas your actuality is your state of being right now. You are hot, you are cold, you are happy, you are jealous, whatever. According to Aristotle, actuality and potentiality are opposites in that something cannot at one time have a particular property both in actuality and potentiality in the same respect. If something is actually loud, like a siren, it can be potentially quiet, or it could be potentially, I don't know, crushed or some other property, bright. But it's not also potentially loud nor is it actually quiet at the same time as being actually loud. The second one makes sense. If something is actually loud, it's not actually quiet. But if something is actually loud, it's not potentially loud as well. The potentiality is kind of the flip side of the actuality. And you can be going through a process of moving from one to the other, and that is what is going to be movement or change. So... One of the most common points of confusion in this argument is the usage of the word move or change. This confusion arises as Aristotle uses a Greek word which could mean either move or change in English. It's a bit confusing. However, exactly the meaning here may be cleared up by the following explanation. Something is moved or is changed when it goes from being potential to actual. So when the siren goes from being loud to being quiet, it is changed or it is moved in some way. When a particular potentiality actualizes, the object that changed is moved and some other object whose actuality caused that is 
moving that thing. So on the other hand, something moves, changes something else when it causes that other thing to go from a potential state to an actual state. So we've got things that move and things that are moved. So things that are moved are what are changing from potentiality to actuality, whereas things that are moving those things are causing that change through their actuality, through what they actually are. For example, a hot plate might change a pot of water by taking its potentiality of warm and actualizing it. Or an industrial robot might take a set of parts and change them by taking their potential to be a car and actualizing that potential. But of course, the actuality of that hot plate, that that hot plate was hot, itself used to be a potentiality that was actualized. What actualized that? Well, the electricity in the wall, or, and so on and so forth. The robot, similarly, the actuality of its state of affairs that it can build cars was created from potentiality of a bunch of parts to be able to be built into a robot that could build cars. So even the things that are moving are themselves moved from that previous state of potentiality to that state of actuality. Now, using these concepts, Aristotle and Aquinas will attempt to demonstrate that there must be some unmoved mover, something which acts but is not acted upon, something which changes but does not itself change, something which is pure actuality with no potentiality, which is required to underwrite all motion or change in the world. Hopefully I was starting to build some of this intuition a second ago when we were talking about, well, the robot in order to have the actuality to take those potential parts and turn them into an actual car, it had to itself be the potentiality of a bunch of parts. And those parts, in turn, had to be the potentiality of a set of rocks that could turn into that part. And that rock had to have the potentiality, perhaps, of being magma or lava and being turned into that and that, and so on and so forth. All of these things had the potential to be something else, but what made them that thing? something moved them. Now we can't have an infinite regress of things that are themselves being moved by something else and that causes them to move something in the future. There has to be something at the end of that regress which is an unmoved mover, which is pure actuality, which cannot itself change but changes everything else. According to Aquinas, that is God. So let's take a look at one formulation of the argument. Change or movement exists in the world. Things go from potentiality to actuality. This is at least a common sense statement that most people other than maybe a skeptic might agree with. Yes, things change in the world. My water gets warmer, parts turn into cars, and so on and so forth. Number two, nothing can be both potential and actual in the same property. This is just kind of based around one of the definitions that we started with. Maybe you could have water that is actually hot, but potentially very hot, but that's not exactly the same property that we're talking about. And you can have that movement be happening, that it's changing, maybe the water's changing from a liquid to a gas, and it's going through a process of that change from an actuality, from potentiality to an actuality of being potentially gas to being actual gas, but... Just because that process is going on doesn't mean that any particular water molecule at the same time is both a liquid and a gas. Or if a log is potentially on fire, it's not actually on fire. And if it's actually on fire, it's not potentially on fire. Like I said, this is just something out of kind of the definitions and ideas of actuality and potentiality. Therefore, objects cannot change themselves. They must be changed by some other actuality. Since potentiality must be changed by actuality, and one thing cannot be both actual and potential. So the water is, the potentiality of the water to be hot is actualized by the hot plate, which itself is actualizing the water. And that hot plate in turn had to be actualized by something else. Its potential to be hot was actualized by the potential of the electricity to make it hot, or so on and so forth. Something can't 
actualize itself because it doesn't have that property in actuality, it just has that property in potentiality. These other actualities must have themselves previously been potentialities, which were actualized by some other actuality. Well, if you can't actualize yourself, something else must have actualized that actuality in you. It went from being a potentiality to an actuality. And so, since we can't have an infinite chain of actualities, potentiality moving to actuality, and so on and so forth, all the way down the line, there has to be something which underwrites everything. And that is some unmoved mover. Therefore, there must be some pure actuality, some unmoved mover, which is the cause of all motion, but is not moved itself. That unmoved mover is God. Now, as much as you might want to jump in and object to this argument, let's take a second and look at how plausible this last little inference is right now. And then in the next video, we will tear this thing apart and look at all the objections to it. But for now, think about this. If you were Aristotle and you were convinced that there is something outside of time and space, which is an unmoved mover, which itself cannot change, but changes and underwrites everything. That sounds a lot like at least some of the ideas around a god. Whether it's a Christian god or not, I'm not sure. But those ideas seem to fit very well into this picture. So it makes sense from at least a historical perspective that Aquinas would look at this and say, wow, of course, these ancient Greeks, they were actually talking about God. They just hadn't fully understood what was going on. Let me show you that this argument, it really isn't about an unmoved mover thing. It's actually about God. And I'm going to take you that last step. Okay? Once again, whether or not you think that is believable, Feel free to offer in the comments below, but in a future video, we will cover it. So, stay tuned for objections to St. Thomas Aquinas' first way, and then his second, third, fourth, and fifth ways, along with objections to each of those. Watch this video and more here at carnades.org, and stay skeptical, everybody.